Good evening, everybody. My name is Fred Govea from the Spirit Reflections channel here in New York City with a very special guest today, Rabbi Newton Bonder, speaking all the way from Búzios, Rio de Janeiro. Hello, Newton. Hello. Hello to everybody. It's an honor to have you here with us, Rabbi, and I recently discovered your work, and we're going to just give a couple of minutes for people to join in as they get notified that we went on the air. And I discovered your work thanks to YouTube, thanks to the quarantine. So before we go into you and your work, for those that might be joining us shortly for the first time, Spirit Reflections is a channel that started during the quarantine of interviews. Uh, we call them interviews around the fire or around the fire conversations, episodes. And the goal is to get inspired by that prehistoric fire idea where the tribe gets together after they're done for the day with their chores, their obligations, their survival needs. And they, in the rest time, they sit around, they light a fire, they're in the forest, they're looking at each other for companionship, for friendship, for trust. They're entrusting the elders of the community with the leadership and the little ones they are mentoring. And so everyone's around the fire warming up physically, but they're also exchanging glances and exchanging ideas about what it is to be human. And I like this backdrop that you see, which has this starlight sky in the middle of the night in the forest where we're connected with nature and we're just wondering where we come from, where we're going, what's out there. So the channel is meant to bring people that will share their personal and spiritual journeys with us. How these tools that they've used, spiritual, scientific, artistic tools that they've used along the way, have shaped who they are as people as well as the work that they do. So we're going to dive, as soon as we do our opening vignette here, dive right into Nilton. Uh, Rab Rabbi Nilton is also his work. Now, as I was mentioning before we went on the air, this is a conversation that can go well past midnight since he has so many published books and we can take so many different directions in our around the fire conversation, but there's only enough logs that we've stored. So we, we run, we're gonna run out of logs. So we're gonna focus on his book, which has become a play and the movie, The Immoral Soul. So as people come in, we're gonna say a, a hello. Hello, Ivonetti, good to have you here with us. Ivonetti has become a fan of yours. She's reading your book, Segundas Intenções, Second Intention, she's loving it. And Danuta, welcome. And Marinez also. So a lot of our friends in Florida and also in Brazil are gonna be joining shortly. So why don't we take it away and put our opening vignette, Nilton, which is the um, music by Debussy, the song that he wrote, the piece that he wrote called Reverie, meaning dreams. And when I was putting together this channel, I said, I want to have a song or a piece of music that blends well with this backdrop. And immediately I began to hear in my head the melody. So I said, all right, this must be the one that is the best for it. So here we go. And there it is, that simple, that sets the tone. So for those of you that have never heard of Rabbi Nilton Bonder, I'm gonna read his bio and it's right here. It says, uh, born in Brazil, Nil Nilton Bonder is a best-selling author of 18 books in Latin America, many of which are in English, which we'll show the screen shortly. He leads one of the Brazil's most influential Jewish congregations and is also active in the civil rights and ecological causes. Some of his books have been translated in Europe and Asia, and 12 of them in the United States. His book, which is the subject of tonight's conversation, Our Immoral Soul, was turned into a play in 2006 and won the best play and best actress of 2007 in the entire country. It's been selected among the best 20 books on Judaica in the year 2002 and has been included as in the best Jewish writings of 2002. The book 
and which has become a play, Aura Immoral Soul, is now a critically acclaimed documentary film by Silvio Tendler, which is available for free on YouTube in English and Portuguese. Rabbi Milton Bonder was trained at the Jewish Theological Seminary in New York City, and he mentioned before that he lived for six years right up the street here in the Upper West Side. We're in Midtown West, so walking distance. And he le lectures regularly, le regularly in the United States and in several multinational corporations, universities, United Nations, and he's also a member of the Council for Dignity, Forgiveness, Justice, and Reconciliation. And I think the one of the best ways perhaps for us to take uh, have you take us to your personal and spiritual journey is if we play a little bit before that of a passage from Immoral Soul on YouTube, which I'm going to share the screen now for you friends who have not seen as a little teaser, hoping to entice you to watch afterwards. So I'm going to just put the screen now and then we'll, we'll give you the word new. Uh, here we go. You guys can see the screen, right? Perfect. A compreensão bíblica de corpo e alma é diferente da concepção de Darwin ou da psicologia evolucionista. Ela inclui uma outra dimensão da missão animal além da procriação. Sua natureza transgressora. A alma jamais representou o elemento moral e patrulhador dos bons costumes. Ao contrário. Eles são representados pelos interesses do corpo, das leis, do cumprimento do estabelecido. O maior interesse do corpo é sempre a preservação. Toda moral, toda tradição, toda religião e toda lei são produtos do corpo moral de um animal moral. E toda a sociedade está voltada para vestir a nudez do ser humano. Capaz de romper com os padrões e com a moral. A alma é o componente consciente da necessidade de evolução. Só a alma transgressora, só a traição ao corpo moral, resgata a verdadeira possibilidade de imortalidade. Nanina. It's just a small snippet. We will get to immoral soul shortly. But Rabbi, take us back to your past. Lead us into the journey that made who you are, your personal and spiritual journey, please. So uh, good evening to everybody uh, again. Uh, happy to be around at uh, fire. I feel like in Stonehenge, uh, even though I'm in Buzius, which is a beach in, in uh, uh, near Rio. Um, and uh, as, as you mentioned, I feel very at home in New York City, uh, where I lived for many years. And uh, uh, my journey is, uh, um, it's in, in many ways, it's, uh, I have a, a very different past. I started as a, studying engineering, mechanical engineering. Uh, my family, my father is an engineer. My brother, my older brother was an engineer. And I was uh, raised during, uh, basically, basically uh, during the dictatorship in Brazil, where if you, uh, you the main uh, professions uh, uh, were like very, very non-humanistic. They were very, technical to be an engineer or to be a doctor or to be something. And um, so I was directed in that way. And I didn't feel comfortable. I started my, my, my studies in engineering. Uh, I didn't feel at home and I really decided to start, um, you know, it was, you know, during a period of your life when you're an adolescent and you're, it's, everything is uncharted uh, territory. So um, I, you know, while I was studying, I was teaching in a Jewish day school because I, I liked 
history very much. And I was I was caught by the uh, the uh, this uh, very uh, sad feeling uh, that most uh, the youngsters at, at the Jewish day schools they they were they were very uh, bored with all the, uh, the 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 classes and all that, which is very typical for for their that age. But it wasn't done in a nice way. So I, I started to connect with the fact that uh, a tradition is something very special because it brings, you know, it's like the roots of all of us is our ancestry. And it has so many incredible, uh, you know, treasures. And uh, the most difficult thing is to connect with the next generation, you know, uh, which is usually looks at the uh, older generation as a bunch of old people that don't know what's going on. Uh, and so uh, in a way I was caught with that desire to be a, a connector. Uh, between generations, and I, I, it's it's interesting because uh, I have uh, two ordinations, rabbinical ordinations. One from the Jewish Theological Seminary, which is in New York, and it's uh, on the Upper West Side on 120 Street uh, and Broadway. And uh, I have a second ordination with uh, that I got from Rabbi Zalman Schechter, who is a, was a Hasidic uh, rabbi. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm mentioning that because when he uh, gave me that second ordination, he made a, uh, a play on the word of my of my my family name, which is Bonder, which comes from bonding, from Bonder. Uh, and in Hebrew, uh, it works well also because Bonne means to build. So Bonne Ador, Bonne to build a new generation. So he he call me like instead of bonder, bonnet ador, bonder. So in many ways, I, I feel that I was I was caught with that desire to uh, to uh, be uh, you know to uh, connect the, uh, the the hearts of the new generation to the older one. And uh, from there, I was able to uh, uh, release, I think, uh, unleash a lot of my personal spiritual. Uh, you know, life that didn't have much of a of a format until uh, I started my studies. My family was not uh, particularly observant of, of, of Jewish uh, religion, Judaism, and so it was uh, it, it was it was new uh, for me. But at the same time, it was also a connection. I, I then found that. My grandfather was very connected. was was a, was a was a singer at, at a synagogue in the south of Brazil, Porto Alegre, and uh, those things come come from from distant realities, distant worlds, and they get to you uh, at the right time. And so, Immoral Soul was that one of your earliest published works? Uh, not really. Uh, uh, I was very successful. I was uh, when I came back to Brazil. I started uh, as a rabbi, and uh, I wrote a trilogy that was very, very successful in Brazil. It was called the Kabbalah of Money, the Kabbalah of Food, and the Kabbalah of Envy, because there is a saying in the Talmud that says that a person can be known by its um, its pocket, its glass, and its anger. Uh, because in Hebrew it, it, it works very well. Koso, kiso, vekaso. So uh, it's like a play on words. And uh, those books uh, did very well in Brazil, amazingly well. I sold uh, close to a million uh, copies in Brazil. Uh, and uh, it was the first time that the uh, uh, Kabbalah was presented uh, in a sort of a new f fashion or new perspective. And that, that was much before Madonna, much before, we're talking 80, 88, I think it was. Um, and, uh, and in reality, there was a, an article at the uh, New Yorker um, back in the 90s uh, uh, saying that uh, Madonna uh, got, to, got, uh, got to know about Kabbalah through a uh, Kabbalah of money. She had wow. a... She had a personal uh, personal uh, trainer uh, that was Brazilian. Oh. And he gave her that book 
that came out in English. And so I have a connection there with that interest. But that was much before there was no Kabbalah crave in, uh, in, in the U.S. anywhere. So it was uh, like a novelty and it, it, it did very well in Brazil. And from there, I started, I became like a writer. I was just uh, included at the, uh, at the uh, Literary Academy of uh, Rio de Janeiro. And, uh, but uh, this uh, Almen Moral was probably like my, I think this is my seventh book. Or seventh book. So it's seven, well. From seven, six, seven, seven book. So um, you're you're well into your published career uh, when you get to Immoral Soul, and what I found really striking when I watched the documentary that Silvio Tendler put together based on the book is that it was a two-hour film that took us eight to watch, because every ten minutes you have to stop and go, oh my god, and you have to write down the insights, and and it's extremely challenging. So I, I really was dr uh, drawn to it. You know, the, the, uh, the, uh, the book actually was a disappointment because when it came out, it, uh, it, it sold okay, but I, I, was, I was coming from very good, big successes and literary successes with the other books. And the editor was a little, you know, disappointed because it didn't do as well as the other books. And, and it stayed like that for a few years when I, uh, like two or three years, uh, and I was invited to a, a TV show in Brazil, in Rio. And, um, and uh, for some reason, they, they wanted to talk about that book. So I, I went to that show and uh, it, it had several, uh, several uh, people that were invited to participate, each one talking about their own uh, work and there was there uh, an actress uh, uh, Clarice Nisquier and uh, there was a situation in this program where she was challenged because she said she was a she was a, she was a Jew -boo. she was a, a Jewish Buddhist in her uh, a faith Jew a Jew -boo. and uh, so the, at that time that was the time of the faxes you know and uh, we got, the program got a fax with a woman very angry saying that she could not be a, a, Jew, a Jewish Buddhist because there was, not, there was not such a thing that she either was a Jew or a Buddhist and there was not both of them. Anyway, so she was a little, uh, you know, awkward and, and I, I intervened and I said, no, 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 it is many Jews go uh, other ways and they find uh, their... Uh, sometimes is the, is the way for them to discover the treasures of the, the treasures of their own tradition. Right. So uh, yes, people wander around uh, many other traditions until they they are able to uh, to to see value in their own. And so I sort of defended her in a nice way, in a very gentle way. And so at the end, she was like very very glad that I <laughs> that I interceded. Uh, uh, on her behalf, and and uh, and I was holding the book, and I was, to be honest, I was going to a party. I was invited to a party, and I didn't want to have the book. And the uh, the uh, anchor person that was uh, uh, that I was going to give the book already had the book, so I I, hand, I gave it to uh, to Clarice, and uh, she went away. I went to my party, and and a few weeks later, she called me, and she said, "I want to do a play on your book." Oh wow! Yeah, and it was an incredible partnership. Um, I, I was I worked with her for the uh, adaptation, and um, it became an incredible success in Brazil. I think it's like for uh, monologues; it's probably the long-lasting monologue. It's it, it was on ongoing uh, uh, for thirteen years. Stopped just because of the pandemic, and. Um, uh, and the uh, entire book was was performed as a monologue. The uh, the, the uh, what she does is she uses basically the text, you know. And, and I I was uh, listening to you mentioning the film that you had to stop and 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 take notes. Uh, the uh, the uh, it's very dense. The, the 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 book is dense, and and she uh, she did a wonderful work, you know. 
and uh, uh, and she was she does uh, a good part of the play naked. She's she's un, uh, you know because uh, at the beginning of the book I start saying that there was no uh, nudity in the in in nature. Right. You know, this is we created the idea of being nude. Right. Um, and uh, so she she uh, the sort of like a, like a, a way for her to uh, present the play. Uh, what she presents as her body is really her soul. So it was a challenge to present a physical body and to make it not uh, to, to not have a, any sensual. Uh, uh, connotation, right? Connotation, exactly. And uh, for you to see her soul by looking at her naked body. So it was very daring. And uh, uh, even the, the text was, was very difficult. What, what became like a cult uh, thing in Brazil is that people went to see the play. Like you were saying about the movie, they went two times, three times. Uh, we had like a mileage program for people that went more like five times. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and it was funny. And she would stop, she would stop. She had this uh, recurse during the, uh, the play that she would stop at a certain point and she would say, you throw me a word and I'll repeat parts of the play that we, we did until this moment. The, wow. The text. So people would say freedom and she would go back, you know, like a Google search in her mind and she would say like a 30 second repeat part of the, what she had done, uh, said uh, with that word freedom. Uh, so it became very interesting, the whole thing. And it really touched people very deeply. Uh, Marine saw the play twice. She said it was awesome. Yeah. Now, Rabbi, why do you think people are so drawn to this work? And the title of it is Our Immoral Soul, a Manifesto of Spiritual Disobedience. I think people are, I think the whole uh, idea that is written by a rabbi, by, by a uh, religious person, uh, and it is presenting tradition, but not only tradition. When, when, I'm, when I mention the word tradition, it means your education, the way the way you were educated. Uh, and uh, most of the time, we're, we're working on that. You know that idea that things are either good or bad, or right or wrong. You know, basically, education is very much creating you a critical uh, perspective which is okay, it's fine, that's the way we do things. But, um, but, but not, not, it's not uh, when you grow up, when you graduate the, the first part of your life, you understand that your parents, your teachers, your rabbis, your, your whatever, uh, you know, um, pastors, fathers. Authority uh, figures. Whatever, uh, oh, yeah, exactly, your authority figures, your government, whatever, they don't know exactly what is right and wrong. And they create laws with the best intention. They create morals with the best intention. But but you have to be able to discern when the right is not right and when the wrong is not wrong. Uh, you cannot teach that to a child because if you teach that to a child, you got to destroy the whole education. You have to really be. Uh, you have to have a. Uh, you have to have a rigorous. A perspective until they understand that they, they get this education, uh, but they have to be created, uh, they have to be educated in a way that they are able to understand that they, to become a critical person, uh, you know, to have the, uh, the critical ability to, to look at life and situations, it requires you to deconstruct uh, many of the values that you've learned. But you don't have to deconstruct them because they are use, useless or wrong. You have to deconstruct them because for them to be really useful, they have to be able to uh, to uh, be flexible in a way. Uh, and I think yeah. you mentioned a lot this, this idea to transgress also means to transcend so you can transform. So all of these ideas are connected. And at first it can be seen by the society, by the community, by the authority figures, by the people that have boxed you in as something of a disobedience, something wrong, where the moral becomes a, a limitation, right? 
Uh, and, you know, I, I tie, as I was preparing for our conversation today, I remembered a question, and for many of us that are watching here in uh, Spirit Reflections, they, they have a familiarity with Spiritism, Kardec's Spiritism. And there is a, a question in the Spirits book, which was the first book he compiled in the uh, 1800s of questions and answers he asked spirit entities through several mediums all over Europe and North America. A pretty intriguing question, because the answer the Spirits provide makes you really think uh, th this is the question. It's 932. And it asks, he asks the spirit uh, entities, why do the wicked of this world usually exert a great influence over the good ones? So why is it that they have so much power and dominance and they seem to dominate over the good ones, right? So this is the answer, which I love. The answer is because the good ones are not assertive. The wicked are scheming and daring, whereas the good are timid. The moment that they want to, the latter, the good, will prevail. So I think the moment that they want to, would that be the moment to transgress? The moment to perhaps... I think, I think it's important to understand this. Um, uh, there is a, a very important uh, part to be played by what we call wicked. Uh, right. There was a beautiful story in the Talmud where the rabbis uh, were able for, uh, you know, they were able to, uh, to, uh, uh, to imprison the, uh, what we call the, uh, the impulse for, for, for evil, the evil impulse. Uh, in a certain situation, they were able to trap that impulse and to uh, uh, make it captive. What was the problem? Next day, the chicken would not lack, a, would not, not um, uh, uh, you know, uh, lay eggs. You know, people didn't want to go to work. Lovers would not make love because uh, it is a very important ingredient in, in, in life. What we call uh, sometimes a, a little aggression, a little, uh, all this, uh, the, this, the components of, of what we call evil or, 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 or wrong. So uh, life is not, uh, you know, even when you, when you go to, uh, to uh, uh, you know, talking from the Jewish tradition, when you go to uh, talk about Satan, which is like a, an angel, he's an angel. He's, he's part of the, uh, the, the project. He's not right. out of the project you know there are many theologies that made him like you know a second power you know a dispute with god no 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 is uh the idea that he is uh he's built in in ourselves you know right. in hebrew the word means uh a, a block a blockage you know we have blockages because we have uh this uh, evil impulse in in us but this evil impulse is responsible for evolution there is right. no Evolution. If you do not allow that impulse to uh, to uh, to go into uncharted territories, uh, all of us we know. Now you you are you you left Brazil. You went to New York. There were many many moments of that move, and many moves that we do in our lives. They are very daring, and they require. Um, uh, we can put in nice words. They require dreams. You know, but you, 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 if you look, you really need the, the, the kind of aggressiveness. You know, you cannot be soft. You have to face so many things. So you have to put yourself in a, in a situation where you have, you have to face so many challenges and you have to be sort of uh, tough. And so it's it, like the, the energy of anger when you harness it and direct it, would that be also a way to push exactly. through right? so, so, uh, uh, the most important thing is not to, uh, to to separate things but to learn how to bring them together you know when when i was uh, uh, with that title immoral soul made so many people confused in many ways right. Right. immoral is such a negative word people would say oh, what did you call the amoral you know i said no 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 it's immoral because when you do something that is in many ways uh, different one from what people expect, your parents expect, society expect. You know, what are you gonna face 
uh, from their perspective is that you're being immoral. You know, right. I don't have, uh, you know, people that have problems, uh, situations with gender and all that, they know in the eyes of their parents or family or society, they look immoral in what they're right. doing. Okay. So many things that uh, were looked as immoral in the past, like, for example, people thought, you know, it's unbelievable, but people thought that uh, 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 going against slavery was immoral. Right. You know, for a certain society that was established in, in concepts unbelievable to us nowadays, even though we're still struggling with, with it. But, uh, but uh, so uh, 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 and in many ways, anything that is an evolution represents a new body, uh, the, the idea of an evolution. For example, we were in a certain moment, we were walking with, you know, we, we were not walking with two legs, uh, right. around, you know. So uh, any move that was done for the generation that was uh, testifying that that was there present at that change, it looked immoral, you know. Right. And, and, and so, uh, but for sure, there are many things that are immoral, which you should not do it. But uh, the idea that I'm using in the book is not so much as doing immoral things to other people. We're talking about being immoral to your own morals, to your right. own, you know, it's a deconstruction of who you are, not who other you people. you see yourself as, your identifications also, right? And it's good because in the movie, uh, you interview people from all over the planet who embody that in their lives, who have done that movement, the courage, the daring, the whatever words we want to use. And so it makes it come alive in such a powerful way. The struggles that these people have gone through, including some examples which are really touching like Palestinian and Israeli soldiers, both who have lost their own children in the conflict, decide to join an organization just to fight for peace in order to get together to for the cause of peace, you know? And you see the amount of hostility they encounter from their own community by joining the cause for peace. Just one example, right? Exactly, but what happens is that people that are ingrained or involved with the, with the situation, they see somebody from their tribe talking to the other. For them, it, it's immoral. It's, it's something that is breaking, it's being, uh, you know, it's being, you're betraying your, your own and uh, but people looking from outside, they say, "No, no, wait, wait, wait a minute. This is perfect. This is beautiful. Yeah, this is the way it's gonna be in the future. For sure, people will will uh, resolve their their conflicts in ways that are you know not wars." And, right. Uh, no, another another very beautiful thing that I got from the documentary was this idea that. Um, in, when you see the documentary, it shows you, well, I actually completely lost what I was going to say. So I'm going to be silent and let you continue. It'll come to me. Okay. Okay. <laughs> this happens sometimes. No, it's okay. No, but, uh, but the, the, the movie has a more political uh, perspective. The, the play was more like psychological. So a lot of people, uh, I would meet people in the streets after you know a few years of the play, and people would come to me and say, "Oh, I divorced because of you, Rabbi." <laughs> and I was like, oh, no, 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 that's not me. It, it wasn't me. <laughs> but uh, 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 the whole idea was that people, uh, 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 you know, they felt that they uh, they should really look into situations in their lives that that where they they felt that they were being very faithful, but. Right. Uh, but 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 they were not being faithful. By being faithful, they're not being faithful because things were not really uh, alive and real, be it at work or in a relationship with somebody else. Uh, and uh, it, it, they got the, the understanding that is is much more of a betrayal to live in that way than to uh, to to go your own and 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 free the other person so that they, they can. If that is the situation, if you cannot work it out. In fact, the documentary hooks you from the very beginning because the few, the first few words that it says is this thing that goes, there is a look that knows how to tell right from wrong. A look that sees when obedience means disrespect and disobedience means respect. A look that recognizes the short, long paths and the long, short paths. A look that lays bare, that doesn't hesitate to point out that there are perverse loyalties and betrayals of great loyalty. 
So you, you question everything. And sorry, go ahead. But you see, the, the, the very beginning of the Bible, you know, and people don't yes. get that, you know, that, uh, uh, how come the book will begin? It will be such a negative, horrible book. The first thing it brings is human being doing the wrong thing, you know, and, the, the, you know, being like, you know, doing the original sin, you know, and, and you know, spoiling everything. You know, there was a beautiful plant that we come and live in this incredible spot called, you know, paradise where you had everything you wanted, you know, swimming pools. And uh, you imagine, you know, people from Miami or, or, you know, right from the Caribbean, you imagine what it would be paradise. You call all the hotels, all the hotels in the Caribbean, you call that paradise, this paradise, that, that. So uh, how come the book starts like that? You know, such a negative thing, you know, and, uh, but because if you read it like a child, you know, if you don't, if you don't read it uh, in, in the, in, you know, between the lines uh, as an adult and as a mature person, you don't understand. That's the beginning of our our history, and everything that there is it, 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 that is so special about the human beings be, uh, began at that situation, because yeah. it was it was a situation as a child. God tells you, don't eat from that tree. If you want to be a good child, don't eat from the tree. They were not a good child because they and and this is very beautiful in and, and Jewish uh, commentaries. Uh, the rabbis went over this idea. This hey, but there's, there's something wrong there, you know. Uh, so uh, uh, maybe they're they're not so so lost. So so maybe they're doing something in purpose. Maybe human beings are very noble and not this disastrous. Uh, a species that, that uh, you know, came to the world. Um, we're still fighting with those two possibilities. Okay, right. but uh, but uh, let's let's be positive. Uh, so the, the human being is uh, they realized uh, why would why were we, what what are we doing here? Right. What was the meaning of this spot? Uh, and, and, they, and they were able to figure that they they're here with a mission, which is to choose for themselves. Right. And they had, there's no way, there's no way you can begin this new venture if you're not able to say no to your daddy or your mom. Yeah, to, ex to experiment. Yeah, You have to do it. And in a way, mom and dad, very, very worried, will be, they will be very disappointed if you don't do that in a certain way. Yeah, and one of the things I got from watching the movie Immoral Soul is that you explain, it explains crucial passages from the Old Testament in a very accessible and uniquely insightful way. I had never looked at Lot's wife and the women of the Old Testament as transgressors. So all of these key passages that are so deeply ingrained in our collective unconscious, whether we're Jewish, Christian, or otherwise, you shed light in such a powerful way, in a psychological way, which is, I think, the consciousness we are mature to discern from. We have already gained enough psychological maturity as a collective, I think, in order to look back at the foundations of these religious texts in a new light that is doesn't have dogma, doesn't have fanaticism attached to it. And regardless of the belief system, you can look at that and come away from it. That's why it took me eight hours to watch because there are so many implications in the way you shed light on them. So I really appreciated that. And while I mentioned that, I want to share the screen one more time for those that would like to watch the documentary in English. Here it is. It's on this uh, channel called Canal Curta. But if you type in Immoral Soul English on YouTube, this will be the screen that pops up all in uh, with English subtitles, and you will see Rabbi going all over the world interviewing uh, fascinating people. Yeah, basically immoral souls. Immoral souls. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's yeah. why I, I went searching for, it was a road movie trying to, uh, to uh, find immoral souls around the world. And uh, I, I used, because I didn't want to talk about immorality of other people, I, I have the, uh, basically uh, Jewish immorals 
because it will be more uh, suitable to uh, for me to speak about that than to go into other uh, realms and, and, and talk about other people, traditions or... or uh, and I'm curious, Rabbi, what prompted you to write this book? How, what was the genesis of it? Did you have a moment where you said, okay, a light? I, I, you know, I'm, when I told you that I, I was a, a, a bridge between generations, uh, to be a bridge between the generations, you have to be a bridge also between uh, the, uh, uh, the old and the new. And uh, that bridge is a bridge that is able to translate what is the new? The new, is, in many ways, is a transgression. is is different. Right. Uh, so you have to to translate the new uh, to be able to to connect the new with the old, because a transgression, in a way that I'm saying, is not a rupture with the spirit of the old. is is a rupture with the format of the old. So when when you do that work and tell people of the new, and tell them what you're doing is not very different from what your grandfather, mother were doing. Um, in, in form, in many ways, is very different. But because you, you did it your way, you, you went your way, you know, and they did the same way, they did the same thing. It's, uh, you connected in that capability of creating a new form, a new form of, of living, more adapted, more uh, coherent, coherent, to the to the environment that you're leaving and your conscious uh, uh, that is evolving is learning all the time and uh, in this you know, moment go ahead. And, and you know this the, this there is a catch in the uh, in the title of the book which is the immoral or the idea of what is immoral and what usually we use and and you know talking to to a public that really is connected to uh spiritualism and all that has to do with immortality and uh, uh, um, I think this is a very interesting uh, point of the book. And I, I think this, the, the little fragment that you showed at the beginning of the movie, I basically say that, that the wrong things that we do are the ones that create the immortality for ourselves. And um, it's a very deep thing because, uh, and I even cite that, I, I'm not a scientist, but if you talk to a scientist, you'll, you'll learn that evolution is base is basic uh, is basically uh, uh, dependent on error, trial Self, and error, right? Error is ran random or whatever. Uh, we don't even know if it's so random, but there is error in the multiplication of cells, and that error uh, promotes possibilities. So error is not is not uh, so much of a sin. It's not it's a bad thing. Yeah, life would not be here if there would be no errors. We'd still be amoebas somewhere, <laughs> okay? Uh, there are a lot, a lot of new uh, ways uh, or, uh, you know, uh, territories that we, we went through that made it possible for us to be here. Do you think that the sense of guilt we feel comes a lot from this mis- conception of the idea of the original sin and the way the story has been handed down to us it comes from the from the feeling that uh what happened to adam and eve was that they lost when do you feel guilty when you lose your innocence that's basically the definition of being guilty you know if you go to to a jury they'll say why why is he guilty because he lost his Innocence. So uh, this is this is the side effect of being of having autonomy. By having autonomy, you 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 make the, you make decisions, yeah, and you have to be res responsible for your decisions. But but not only responsible for what you did. You have to to pay a fine or or pay the consequences. But but by losing your innocence, because instead of following like a child, innocent, what? God or Father said, "Do I decided to stroll in, uh, you know, in territory never before uh, charted? So uh, by doing that, I lose a little innocence, and and I have all those feelings that they are related 
to responsibility, to being autonomous, to be to knowing that error is very problematic. Doing something that was not uh, before uh, done, that do, that doesn't have the security of of being already proved and and uh, w might have consequences. It's not just uh, you know a, a very nice proposition. Yeah, you just go around making uh, errors and right. uh, and ruptures and all that, and everything is going to be fine in your life. We all know it's not like that. Uh, so uh, not only you pay the consequences, but there is an effect on you where you lose your innocence. And if you don't know how to calibrate that, you become either guilty, right? Or you become uh, maybe something that is worse than guilty. You become irresponsible for your acts. So you have to oh. calibrate that because there's no way you're going to lose your innocence and be more autonomous without uh, having to deal a little with guilt. And Not I guess the, the the good aspect of it is you gain maturity and experience from it, perhaps. It's, uh, to, to be very honest, uh, human beings are always asking, well, what do I gain from that? You know? Right, right. I'm not so sure what you gain, but but you gain the fact that you're more awake, that we, we, th that we are uh, venturing ourselves uh, to become more awake. Well, you know, one passage from the New Testament that I think highlights that very well is the parable of the prodigal son, which scholars also mention as the parable of the two sons, the, the young son that goes to the father transgressing and disobeying and say, give me my part of the inheritance. I want it now. Off I go into the world and comes back after feeling guilty and remorse, after he, he squandered everything, right? Comes into his senses and comes back to the father and and thinks to himself, I can't be accepted as a son anymore. I'm not worthy of the title. I will, I would, I will beg to be welcomed back into the house of my father as a servant. Meanwhile, the father does this complete embrace and unconditional love, zero punishment, zero condemnation, just puts the ring on the, the son's finger, does the shoes and all of the symbols that means that he's accepting him back as a son, not a servant. And they have an amazing celebration party for the whole family, the whole neighborhood. And the older son, who never left the house of the father, is so envious of what happens. And I've always been intrigued by the psychology of the older son in that parable. And, you know, how that plays out. You know, uh, uh, Jewish tradition, uh, uh, in w which is very connected to uh, Christianity in many ways, always said that it's, it's, it's uh, somebody that has sinned and was able to come back to his father, you know, metaphorically to his father's house, uh, what we call tshuva, that he made a, a, a comeback. Right. Now, uh, is in a higher position than somebody that never committed any sin because this is this is uh, this is what uh, is expected that you do try to uh, uh, to uh, evolve or or, yeah. or 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 use of your of your free will uh, in uh, but but that you keep learning and and by learning you will understand that on the way of becoming immoral maybe you you have done things that were, uh, were, you didn't do it in the correct way because there, there is never, if you're doing something that is new, there's no way you can do it like a professional. Right. That, you know, that, that's basically what parents, what they want to scare you. Now, and you, you're like, you're ready to embark in a new, in a new uh, travel in your life, journey in your life. You know, they will come to you, do you know how difficult it's going to be? You're going to, Sure, you're gonna make mistakes. There are things that you will have to amend by, by going into a something that is totally new. But at the same time, the parents would look at you after what you have, you have accomplished. They will look at you with much more admiration, not only admiration. They will feel that you are really uh, 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 continuing the, uh, their, their life. Right. This is what I mean by, by immortality. 
you know, uh, without thinking about the other aspects of, of immortality, but by talking about just about the connection between generations, what, what becomes immortal is exactly that uh, sort of myth that where you're, you're the hero that goes right. into the new venture and uh, you undergo all situations, you become very guilty, you do mistakes and all that. you learn from that. And, and you become a bigger person, you, you grow, you mature. And by doing that, you do what your parents really expected. Even though at the beginning they told you, don't go. Right. It's gonna be horrible. You're gonna be, you know, by yourself. We, we're not gonna, uh, you know, uh, uh, voucher that. You're gonna do it by yourself. It's right. you. Yeah, uh, Fantastic. I wanted to ask Rabbi about learning. You were talking about learning. What are some of the things you've meditated on and learned and insights since we started this new phase of quarantine and what what it all means that you see in the future for us? Um, I think I think the quarantine was a was was a challenge in in many ways. Everybody was sort of forced into uh, becoming a little immoral to their own routine. Yeah, uh, you know we could not keep going the same way we would wake up in the morning and do our things. Um, so we all became immoral. And uh, some people are, 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 are very sad because of that. Uh, and some people are, are, are learning the, uh, the lessons that being immoral always present. So I had to change my course of, uh, you know, my routine. Uh, and, uh, you know, I don't, I don't, I, sometimes I don't feel good talking about the good aspects of the quarantine, which are, there are, there are many, there are many. It's, it's hard to talk about that. I live in a country and you also be, are living, now all, not only you're Brazilian, but living in the US. Right. You know, there's so many people dying and suffering. There's so many horrible things happening uh, that uh, it's, it's, you know, it's uh, to talk about the good aspects of this. Right. Uh, it's tough. Thing is very difficult. But, but, uh, on a personal level, this is what what happened. You know, a new connection with time, a new connection with people, a new uh, uh, a lesson about the values of of connections. Uh, uh, you know, uh, there's so many things that are, in, uh, are really impacting um, my my life. And uh, I just wrote my last book is about uh, is about joy. You know, and uh, joy. It's, I, I'm doing a, a, a series of seven books about seven themes, and the the the, the last the, the book just came out a month ago here in Brazil. Uh, just by by chance, I had no intention of being tied to the uh, to the right. pandemic. Um, it's about joy, and uh, uh, what I basically say in the book, and I say that the the joy is not something that has to do with the uh, good things that happen in your life or the bad things that happen to your life. Uh, joy is a, is a disposition that you have, is, a, is, is something that you're born with. Right. That, that's why the book is about the preservation of joy, you know, the art of preservation of joy, because we, we lose that capacity of, of, of protecting our joy. We are born with joy. A child is joyous from the moment you cannot put a, ch a child to sleep because they're so uh they're happy hyper they're, yeah they're not happy because the day was perfect right they're happy because they're they, they were ha they're happy when they cry they were happy when they laugh uh, because they they they're re they're open to emotions they're open to life you know they want to be uh, awake and uh that's why you can't put them to sleep you know uh, that's that's uh, that's uh, a symptom of joy when you don't want to go to sleep. You know, sometimes we we don't go to sleep because we have insomnia because we have problems. But 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 not that, when you really don't want to go to sleep. When you really you you're there with your friends and you know it passed the hour and you're having a good you're having a drink and and, and you really do that crazy thing of staying up until three in the morning. Next day you have to work and and you're you're. You're asking yourself, why did I do that? Why did I do? It? Why? Because you were happy. It was joyful. You, know? yeah. you were, you were, jo you, you were joyful, and and uh, and it had nothing to do. Uh, again, if something 
that I, doesn't please me, you know, happens. I, I'll be uh, uncomfortable. I'll be, you know, I'll, I'll have emotions towards that. But that should not affect my, my joy. So uh, I think uh, it has been a challenge to, uh, to uh, connect and in many ways to reconnect with right. my joy. To rediscover that. I, I want to thank you very much, Rabbi. I wanted to see if you have any kind of closing remarks or closing words for our audience um, on the immoral soul or anything that's in your heart that you feel like sharing now for those of us watching. I think I think the uh, this whole uh, this whole uh, uh, project, our, uh, immoral soul, that was at the beginning a book and then became a play, and then is it became a movie. Uh, basically, is is uh, is telling people, you know, uh, to uh, to really be uh, um, to take uh, to take. Uh, was, I was going to say control is not a good word. To take uh, uh, ownership, responsibility, ownership. You know, to own your own life. You know, and to know that right and wrong, the expectations of people that you care a lot, parents, uh, teachers, uh, uh, friends. You know that, that it will grow if you allow yourself to be more of yourself instead of trying to conform uh, to expectations and everything and. And uh, uh, this is very important, not only for our own, uh, you know, our, our own satisfaction in life, but something that I do present in the book that the happiness or the joy, not the happiness, the joy of, of everybody depends on the joy of each one of us. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, the, the utopic uh, or messianic world that we keep talking about is a world where people are going to be joyful. Yeah. And uh, we have, you know, we, we have a lot of people that are not joyful. Um, you know, uh, we cannot have it together. Yeah. So, and, 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 and to be on that, sta uh, on that state, you have to, uh, to uh, un uh, uncover and discover all your potentials. Right. It will not always uh, be greeted with the, uh, uh, with uh, you know acceptance, with, right? Uh, and you have to be there, uh, able to 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 open that way. And now yeah, speaking uh, and speaking of joy, nothing for me brings me more joy on an individual as well as collective level than music. And when you say uncover the potentialities, it's a great way as a great segue for us to end our Around the Fire conversations because every single Around the Fire conversations that we do, I end with a vignette of a song from 1969 by the soul funk group, The Age, of, um, the Fifth Dimension, called The Age of Aquarius, which is a very intriguing uh, song, which in 1969 hit the number, wor number one world charts of the most uh, played song, one of the most played songs that year. And oh, the whole yeah. lyric. I was huh? listening at that time. Awesome, right? And it really was, I'm, I wish I was there alive in that moment, but I just seen the YouTube videos of them singing that, amazing because the it's all about this transcendence, the joy, this new world. And the refrain of the second part for me is so important as a mantra to allow the joy, to preserve the joy, which is, let the sun shine in. Let the sun shine mm -hmm. in. So I would like to invite all of our friends watching to look at New, uh, Rabbi Newton Bonder's website. Watch The Immoral Soul with pen and paper and with the pause button because you, you just can't watch from beginning to end without stopping. If you did that, you were distracted. You weren't really paying attention. It's very provocative and it was a great um, present for Mother's Day because you, you premiered that on Mother's Day weekend uh, on YouTube. So it was phen phenomenal. I want to give you a big hug here from New York. Be Thank safe, so be healthy. And everybody let the sun shine in and we'll see you soon in the next Around the Fire conversations. Thank you.